Hoda is similar to Hodu. It's basically give praise and thanks. La, the Lamed means unto Yahweh. So hopefully, as a result of this class, a few Hebrew words might be familiar. And so one of the things, the objective, at least my objective of the class, and I couldn't have done it without everybody showing up and listening to people that are on the uh, other side of the camera, who knows where this is going. But this class isn't about me and what I'm doing. This class is about what we all should be doing. And so if you all don't do anything with it, then it's like, well, that's all it is. But for the fact for Jamie and for Dave Matthews and a few others, um, Deb, you've sat down to write some things. And other people, I don't even know everything that's going on. It, it just doesn't matter whether I know or not. But it's, it's what each individual person sits down and does. Remember in Malachi 3.16, which we talked about in the very beginning of the class, it says, and so the, the people, the men, talk to one another about these matters. And a book of remembrance in the heavenly realm was written of, of those people. The names, you might say, were written down. We should read it. Um, here, I'll tell you what, here's the, uh, just this Bible right here. Malachi, isn't that the last book in the Old Testament according to the standards? See, in the Hebrew, Tanakh, they have a different order of the books. So if you're going off the Christian version with the New Testament, you have a different order. Malachi is the last one. So Malachi 3.16, in this version, I don't know which version this is, might be King James, says, Then they that feared Yahweh spake often to one another. Yeah. Spoke about what? Perhaps trying to figure out what day the festival should be on, what is the real calendar, what did Yahweh really expect them to do on Yom Kippur, and if the, if the one commandment for Sukkot is Ak Sameach, which is only rejoice, how are you supposed to do that? It doesn't say what they spoke about, but remember this is speaking about Yahweh's things. They spoke often to one another, and Yahweh heard he hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him. It says for them, but that's probably a Lamed Mem, or maybe a Lamed Pav Mem, which means of them, according, regarding, in reference to them that feared. The word feared there is probably Yira. I'd have to look it up in the uh, Hebrew, but that means to give honor or respect, not just afraid. Yahweh and thought upon his name. And then you have to look at that word think. See, see, in English, I have to sit there and guess what the Hebrew might be. So if I look it up in the. I don't even know where I put my uh, stone snock. I guess I didn't bring it in. Is that the truck stone? Oh, here. Did, could you come up and get the key here, Gary? Do you want to come up and get the key? Okay, hang on a second. I've been doing this on purpose. This is Karen! <laughs> Anybody that looks at the videotapes and it says designed by Cooey, this this design here was Karen's artistic creation. Australia originally, and it's a Hebrew word, kuwa, kuf vav hey or kuf vav yod is my cry. It's Hebrew, pure Hebrew. But the Aborigines, well, you tell the Aborigines still say this to this day out in the Australian outback. Why don't you give them a real Australian version of kui? <laughs> 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 that, that sound, the decibels or however it's done, just echoes across the outback and it goes so far. They've just found that. And it's like, but that is the word in Hebrew for Yahweh saying, this is my 
cry, my call. It's, so to say it's kui, by kui, playing into the Hebrews, as it were, saying this noon sonic as this banner, this emblem of this class, like Jamie had it on his, uh, it doesn't have on today, but it was, it's basically, this is Yahweh's call because the letter Kuf, remember, like the pillar of fire, pillar of fire, pillar of smoke, also means to call, to summon, to assemble, to collect and gather, which is like all the letters gathered around the Newton Summit because every letter speaks of the Mashiach, Yeshua. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so the new psalmic represents the letters of the living one on the support structure or the, the lit menorah of noon being energized and the psalmic being similar to the letter that's the equivalent of the menorah in the Mishkan pattern. And so the idea of the lit menorah, if you can look at the lit menorah in the picture, well, that's like Yeshua being glorified by his people doing what he said to do. The two houses of Israel, the right hand side, the left hand side. So all this is kui. I mean, all these things play in. So the more you know, the more hopefully you can appreciate not only reading Hebrew, but read, appreciate those sort of things we tried to incorporate in some of the artwork. So thank you. I freaking need to come up here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it says Yahweh listen is Yahweh Shema. So then here's one of the things I wanted to say, which is the point of the whole class, which is one of the principal foundational messages within the Aleph Bet, is that everything's reciprocal. Why should Yahweh Shema? It's because the men who spoke to one another are Shema and Yahweh's words. And so if we Shema Yahweh's words, He will Shema us. That's the way it works. And He heard it, which would be Yerah, and the Lord listened. I'm not sure if they have this line by line or not, but it almost looks like it's a zakar, which would be remembered, uh, la, la, la pene, which would be a, that, that's actually the book of remembrance written before his face. Yeah, yeah see, it, it doesn't line up, it's English. I, I have to see a bigger format, but, but thank you. My, my point is, up until a couple of years ago, I, I don't know that I was ever even aware, consciously aware of this verse being in existence. Imagine having your name written in Yahweh's presence in this heavenly realm. And it says, you know, in the last day when the books are opened and there's like this book of names, book of deeds, book of remembrance. I mean, who knows how many books? But he says, those men, those earthlings who take their time and effort, thank you very much, to regard Yahweh's words, they will be written in this book unto eternity. And I believe that the purpose of having this class is to facilitate all of your names being in that book. Amen. We have fulfilled the contractual requirement of getting your names in that book for having this class. And that's, that's a pretty big thing. If the letter Sheen, which because we had a couple breaks, because Jamie and Israel and all, we had a few weeks off. But at the letter Sheen, I handed out this 12 by 20 or so, and it had these words. And then there was three supplemental pages, which had the definitions of these words, where each word was broken down into a number of words. I tried to color code them so that it would be easy reference. And there was a dot in between each one so that each word, hopefully, I didn't take much time to explain it. But then there was also a, people who speak Hebrew might think I butchered the phoneticization of it, but nevertheless, it was a way to pronounce these words in Hebrew. So I was talking to Jamie and he says, what was that about? It's like, I guess the point didn't come across very well. 
but I handed it out. So also these would be available. I think I printed up about 50 of them and I had a few in the bookstore. Mm -hmm. We want to make all these things available online so that people can get them if they want. And then Lee and Sarah printed up these shirts with this printed on front. So what this is, is each one of these are names of Yahweh and the meaning of the name keyed to the alphabetic letter that it corresponds to in the color, which is key to this chart. So if, if anybody's interested, after Sukkot, because Sukkot's going to be a week, the radio station's going to have a 10-day Sukkot, and everybody's you know, getting ready for hunkering in for the winter. But we'll continue the class after Sukkot at everybody's convenience, and we'll, this will be what the class is about. This chart. And these are all Yahweh's names. And so the objective is to say, as I said before, if you learn how to read Hebrew, you need something to read. And if there's a few words that you can pick up, what are the best words to, to start with? How about his name? These are all words that are used to describe his Shem, which is his name. But it's not just name, remember. It's not like Joe Schmo. Because, and I'm saying this to explain something on the chart. Why does that say that? Joe Schmo, oh, what's his name? Well, see, in English, if you don't know somebody's name, you say, oh, he's just some old Joe. Joe Schmo. And I remember hearing Marty Guest singing a Hebrew song, and part of me said, some old schmo like I am, and I thought, schmo? Why, the word shem means, in Hebrew, name, fame, renown, reputation, the stuff that you're concerned with, the stuff you, maybe your occupation, but it's more than your occupation, it's where are you at? And so, shem nem with a vav means his name, so shmo means his name. And to say, oh, he's just some schmo, is, that's kind of a guttural English, but literally it means, well, what's his name? As if, well, it doesn't really matter what his name is. But in English, you see, we have the letter J, and the letter J replaced the letter Yud, but it, it turned into both an I and a J, which is why in Latin and Greek you have the, the letter I, and there was no letter J until about 500 years ago. Which is why his name couldn't have been either Jehovah or Jesus, because there was no letter J. The letter J was invented, and before they sometimes you'd have a two I's next to each other, and so for the sake of pronunciation, they'd have one I or writing even script-wise, they'd have a short letter I, and then they'd have an elongated I, and that elongated I became the letter J. You can look this stuff up on the internet and find it, or a good dictionary encyclopedia. So, but the letter J would have been a Yud. Well, then the word Joe would have been a Yud Vav. Well, now we have been discussing what the letters mean. Yod as a prefix means he will. And Vav as a suffix basically means his. So Yod Vav, like right here in blue, pronounced Joe or Yo, literally could be read as he will his. Well, then if Shmo means his name, or his renown, or his occupation, or the stuff that he's really concerned about, Yo Shmo literally means, in Hebrew, he will do every single thing that his name is in regards to, re referring to his character, identity, and nature, because that's his passion, and he will see to it that it gets done. Amen. That's Joe Schmo. And yet, see, in English, it's out exactly the opposite. Oh, just oh, Joe Schmo. It doesn't matter who he is because he has a nameless face and nothing. But yet, this is Yahweh's Schmo. This is Yahweh's Shem. All these words, he will do every one of these. But if you don't know what these are, then you go, oh, well, that's nice to know. That's nice to know. You don't know. But if you read this, you can know and you can count on. So, the purpose of the class tonight, which we only have about an hour, I thought it was interesting to have the, the eating first, that way I'm trapped because everyone has to leave the time and stay in the room. <laughs> too long in the class so you don't get to eat. So, anyway, the point being about this is that the chart, I'm going to try to do this a couple different ways all at the same time. This chart here, there's a number of things about this chart which I've mentioned during the class. 
And I can briefly describe, because there's probably some people on the camera here that are watching on DVD that have never even seen this chart. They know what it is, they see it sitting off in the background. So here's a big version of it. And if anybody wants one of these, Oregon City Sign has them up. This is like over $100. But if you notice, I've made reference to the fact that we took this and put it at the bottom. I don't know if anybody can see that. This is the alphabetic uh, chart that we had originally up in the wall. So this is the bottom and these two wheels, one is the Shema and the other one is the Aaronic Benediction. And I've made the correction here, which should be Tav Bet Nun Yod Tav. I had misspelled it, so this is in red here. So this is the corrected version of the chart. This is the first one. I just opened this up today, just when I got here. No one has ever seen it. So this version is still available. The radio station had printed up a bunch of them. That version, Oregon City Signs, the only people that has it, and if anybody wants that, then that's a whole other matter. It's so big, it's impractical, but when you're referencing it, it's pretty nice. You can actually read it. So, I will describe how the chart lays out. The reason for the color coding in the lines, color coded to this, we have talked about other times, so I, I don't want to go into that whole thing. But I want, to, I want to first talk about why the chart even exists. So here's the thing. I've maintained that the writ, the covenant, is a contract. So in, in our realm, if you have a creditor or somebody that you have a conflict with, they can go to court, write up a summons, and this long arm of the law reaches in, grabs you by the shoulder, right in the middle of you having an otherwise normal day, trying to go to work, or trying to do what you're doing, and they can summon you and drag you into their court and say, you will now come to terms with this. Now the economy around the world has had some trouble lately, and people have been out of work lately, and so the financial obligations which we have incurred, well-intentioned, well-meaning to maybe pay, if there's no means to pay them, suddenly all our creditors have the legal right to grab us, drag us into court, and start pummeling us with the legal system. They have that right. Is it merciful? Is it responsible? Is it what ought to be doing to one another? That's another matter. But here's a question, because I had that happen to me, a few different creditors. They, their jurisdiction is higher than our normal life, so they have the right to interrupt our normal life, grab us with a summons, and drag us into their court. But Yahweh's court supersedes their court. They, the attorneys, the lawyers, the ones who know that system, spend their life focusing in every little detail of words and how to twist words and spin words and manipulate words, invent words, tricking us who was like, oh, what? And they become known as the clerks, the clerics, the clergy, the keepers of the words. You can look up in any dictionary, encyclopedia, you'll find where all these words come from. However, in Daniel 12, in the position of the psalmic, it says, the wicked will do wickedly, it's down here in the last line, and none of the wicked will understand. But the righteous will understand. Now wait a minute, the righteous will understand is in, in the position of the pay. None of the wicked will understand is in the position of the eye, and then the wicked will do wickedly, being the antithesis of doing righteously, is in the position of the psalmic, psalmic eye and pay. And you go, for the wicked to not understand, is that just somebody saying, oh well, those guys, you know, they just won't take the time to... Or is this an authoritative declaration of Yahweh when he designed the system of the universe and says, this is the way it's going to work. I'm going to say something. And if you do wickedly, I declare hereby, you shall not understand. One word, and go right past it, you, you won't get it. If you choose to regard his words, you will understand. What are the benefits of returning to Torah? Well, if you look at that, it means, so I can understand. Understand what? Well, if you don't return to the Torah, you won't even understand what there is to understand. And it'll all seem like, <laughs> what I found, interestingly enough, is that even as a believer, 
If you don't keep Sabbath, something is lost and missing. And you go, what? What do we don't have? You don't know what you don't know. But once you start keeping the Sabbath day, somehow something else comes into view. And you couldn't have even guessed what that might be. And so you can say, oh, well, nobody knows. We can't. We're never supposed to. Uh, Yahweh didn't even intend for anybody to keep the instructions, you know. Those are the words that keep us from returning to the instructions, that keep us in the dark, that keep us bamboozled, and so befuddled that we don't even know why we would want to. We don't know. Because Yahweh said, the wicked won't understand. And wickedness is not just a matter of doing evil, but it's not doing what he said. It's not regarding his words. The same word for evil, bad, and wicked, which is spelled rash ayan, Resh Ayin, or it, it can also be Resh Ayin Hay, is the same word, look in this red dictionary, it's the same word for friend, companion, associate. It's like, love your neighbor as yourself is that same word. So you could translate that as love, it wouldn't have a Hay if it was your neighbor, it would have a Kaf, because remember Kaf is a suffix, means your, and it's Roika, Roeka. The ka at the end is the kaf, meaning yours. And it says, love your evil as yourself. Now you have to think, or it's neighbor. It's translated, how do you know that's neighbor? So you look at the dictionary, you look through the Hebrew words and say, I'm not sure how they know whether that's evil or neighbor. You can say, well, why is this word for evil? Well, what's a wretch? A wretch is an exalted man. The resh is something, remember, it's kind of like this manifold, like a manifold on a engine. It pulls in the air and the fuel and it mixes it and then it pushes it into the combustion chamber and then it goes out through the exhaust manifold and the exhaust manifold it has a... The picture here, kind of like a tree, but not exactly, it shows kind of like a root system, like a heating plant. It has the input. It goes into the combustion pressurizing chamber and then it goes back out, distribution. So the manifold literally has many branches collecting into one and then one going out into many different branches. That's the concept. Well, that's Resh concepts. And here's this I, which has to do with understanding or observing or seeing or weighing and measuring. And you could say, why would the same thing be friend is for evil? And it's like, when you do evil, how would you define what evil is? Badness? Badness in terms of what? If you just think, I was at a concert one time, many years ago, and I felt this presence of evil. Nothing bad was happening. I, I felt this presence of evil. But I couldn't describe it other than to say, if you have your eyes closed and you're near a fire, you can feel heat. Describe what that heat is. Well, it's hot. No, that's the same word. How do you describe heat? Well, you can't, really. Close your eyes and describe the color red to somebody. How do you do it? You know red, but you can't describe red. You can't describe. Okay, but you'll know evil when you see it because it's what you do to one another. So there's something about this spirit of evil, but on the other hand, evil is what you do input and output regarding when you see your neighbor. If you help your neighbor, that's not evil. When you harm your neighbor, that's evil. Evil. When you, when you harm or do maliciousness or you intend to, to sabotage him, that's evil. So if there's any mysterious thing about, gee, what's really evil, it's doing bad stuff to your neighbor. So if you look at these words and you try to make these connections, it's like, oh, okay. But here's this notion of this court of law. And to sit there and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this alphabet chart, I'll, I'll go basically in a few minutes, tell you how it's broken up. I've done this before. Two months before we started this class at the radio station, we had a four hour taping of this same thing describing what's on the chart. But see, nobody really even knew what the letters mean. So part of that was describing what the letters mean and so forth. But the purpose of the chart is sort of to explain the legal dynamics 
of the covenant. Because what I contend is the entire alphabet is the contractual obligations, commitments, rights, and privileges in the legal court of the eternal kingdom. This is a legal document. And in any court of law where one person wants to drag the other person in, the law is not the law in the books. The legal law, the federal, the Oregon state cha uh, statutes, those aren't the law between two people. The terms of contractual agreement is the law, and those statutes merely enforce the weight of the agreement between the individuals that they had when they originally signed up. That's the way the legal system works in America. And because it's based on British law, it probably goes further than that too. So the point is, any piece of paper, any agreement in this realm can be a contract. Anybody feel in, feels infringed upon, they can take it to the court of law and demand that the judge vote which one has the right to expect what behavior after the other. That's the way it works. If this alphabet is the contractual agreement between Yahweh and Israel, Yahweh has the right to behave according to what these letters mean, and if anybody wants to be his people, and they go, what are you doing? Why don't you do this? Why did you do that? He's behaving according to the contract. And if we don't know what the contract is, well, we're like spectators and watching him do this and that. Oh, why did he do that? It's like, I, you know, I don't know. If you don't know the rules of basketball and you think you're watching a tennis game and you're going, what are those guys doing? <laughs> You'll be completely bewildered trying to make sense of how they're running, or you, or you think you're watching rugby and you're actually watching soccer, the same difference. I mean, maybe you played similarly, but it's like, what? How would you put it all together? So we can spend our life sitting here trying to figure out why Yahweh's doing what he's doing, or we can read these words and realize he's doing exactly what he said he'd do. Furthermore, we are a participant in this contract and we are contractually obligated to be doing something. But if we don't know what it is, and we're sitting here doing nothing, we're going to suffer the consequences, which means either we'll get in trouble for not doing something, or we'll miss out on the benefits of doing what we could have been doing. So, in Exodus, where Moshe and the children of Israel were all around Mount Sinai, and Moses said, listen, in order to elevate you, Yahweh has given you this Torah in order to elevate you. But you've got to agree to the terms. Everybody in the camp cried out, everything that Yahweh says we will hear and we will do. They just signed up for a contract. And Yahweh said this contract would be perpetual throughout all your generations, forever. Now, if we want to come into the contract and say, it's a different contract. It's not, it's not this contract. It's, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write up a new contract, or I'm gonna find some sage, some apostle, some, some other so-called wise man who says, hey, oh, I've got a new contract. And you go, oh, hey, you know, this one sounds better than that one. The problem I have, which I've said things which some people might think sound contrary to the Christian church. I'm not against the Christian church because as the scriptures say, we've inherited lies from our ancestors with good intention. We thought we were doing the right thing. We thought we were being good. We thought we were making the Lord happy. Somebody gave us this document and said, this is what you do. It's like, okay, believe this and you go to heaven. Okay, believe this and your sins are forgiven. Okay, believe this because there's nothing you can do. He never intended for you to do it. You couldn't if you wanted to. You don't have to. And guess what? Somebody else did it for you. Jesus did it for you. It's like, wow, what a good deal. 
Just believe, kick back, and say, I'm going. I'm going to heaven. That's the contract. And it sounds great. And then somebody says, oh, wait a second. There's this contract with Israel. And these guys say, and I've heard them on the radio, they say, that's not our contract. Now, does everybody have to have this contract? No. These guys can have a different contract if they want. And when I say they're lying, if these guys say that this contract replaces this contract for the same people, that's not true. That's what they say. That's where the lie is. Now, the people that believe this contract, thinking it's that contract, they were lied to. That doesn't mean they're wrong. That means I'm not saying oh, they're all going to hell and they're bad people. I'm not saying that, but they're deceived. I was one of those people. I was deceived. So the question is, well, who came up with this contract and why? It's like, it doesn't matter. Because part of this contract says, what Yahweh said in his word in the Torah, he says, I get to write the contract. You guys simply choose to agree. And because I write the contract, I'm going to list it out and hand it to you guys and say, do you guys want to agree with this or not? If you choose to agree, sign here. Sign up and it's done. Down at the bottom, there's a top, there's an X, you sign up. The last line down here, sign it. You sign up to all these terms. And if you do, that's the deal. You're welcome to consider the terms of the contract and say, no, thank you. You can invent this other contract here or any number of a hundred different ones. That doesn't make them true, that doesn't make them valid, nor does it mean that the guy who made that contract is now obligated contractually and legally in the court of the both of Malkut al-Lam, which is the heavenly kingdom, to back this contract, because who knows whether he's behind it or not, especially if it contradicts what these terms are. Well, how will you know? The only way you'll know is to find out what these terms are. Now, I keep pointing to the alphabet here as if it's clearly and obviously what the terms are. But because we don't read Hebrew and we don't know what these things mean, it's clearly and obviously not clear and obvious. So the purpose of this chart is to offer a, a proof, like a, a theorem, a hypothesis. You might say kind of like a philosophical reasoning or a mathematical theorem where you try to make a statement. And How do you prove mathematically that the two sides, the legs of an isosceles triangle, actually are equal. It's, oh, it's obvious they're equal. No. How do you prove it as a theorem? That's a basic problem-solving equation, you might say, in a geometry class. Okay. You have to learn how to do that, and then you get graded, and you take a test, and so on. The theorem here is these letters represent the covenant, the contract that Yahweh has with Israel. Now, where's the proof? The purpose of the class is to say, if these letters can be proven to be the contract with Yahweh, then it means a couple things. First of all, any other contracts with disagree with it are null and void when it comes to the relationship with Israel. Now, if somebody else can prove that they have another terms of dealing with him, they can't invalidate this contract if it's forever. All they can say is, we've got a new deal with him, which is why I use the story, if you have a a deal with your wife as a prenuptial agreement, the ketubah, which is the Ten Commandments, that's one thing. And now if you have another contract with the paper boy, that's another thing. But there's no similarity in the relationship between the one you have with your wife and the one you have with the paper boy. So if somebody else has a different deal that they can make up with their contract, and they're going to rest their hope for eternity on that contract, they might want to make sure that they were told the truth. And like I say, if the contract is with the paper boy, that's one thing. But if they were told and they have the expectation that it has actually replaced this contract, they might want to look a little closer. Because when I looked closer, I became convinced based on this information that this is the real valid lasting contract which yet remains. But part of the terms of this contract is that Yahweh said, here's the way it's going to work, Israel. Because this is between Yahweh and Israel. How do I know that? 
There's a line right here, which is the bottom of the pastel colors. And now, besides everything else here, this is kind of a, a soft way to read what it is. It says in the honest position, this is me. Well, in a contract, it says, I'm the guy writing up the paper, so this is me. And you're the one I'm giving it to, so that's you. And in a bit, that position, it says, this is you to whom it may concern. Well, it just so happens that it's to Israel. But any contract is you've got party A and you've got party B. You've got the Aleph and you've got the Bet. You've got the primary signer, and then you've got the one who the contract is extended to. Well, the concept of a Bet compared to Aleph, as we said in the first tapes, is that Aleph was a Chad, it was all one. And Yahweh, in choosing to be a being with a, a relationship, had to make an other. In making an other, if it was still part of him, still attached, it's, it's not an other, so he has to cut the other loose. It's kind of like a mother nurturing, growing within herself, a baby hooked up with a, an umbilical cord, and when the baby is born, she's got to cut the cord. Now that other is cut loose and is an independent being, but then the first thing is like there's this reach out towards the two to reattach, as it were, but on different terms, because the one is no longer part of the one. It's not any longer a chad. It's separate. The gimel is like this tethering, this, this going out and coming back. It's like this dynamics of between two different... So here you've got this picture of the two dots in the line between, connecting the dots. This thematic picture of connecting the dots plays all through the scriptures. Even the word, as we said, asher, I, aya, asher, aya. This is kind of a dot saying, I am, or I will be. This is, I'm identifying myself. This word asher means a straight line. It also means to verify, authenticate, confirm. And then this word here, aya, again, is the exact same word as that. So it's like, here's a dot, a straight line, and a dot. How do you verify that really is this is Yahweh? He said it, that's the Aleph concept. There's the straight line, and then ta, as I have said, so shall it be. As I have set forth, so shall it will arise. When he said yehi or, vav, connecting, straight line, yehi or. And as we said before during the class, it wasn't in English, it's let there be, those are three distinct words, light, and there was light. Well, those are two groups of completely different words. Let there be, and there was, but yet what he said was, yehi, or, and yehi, or. See, when Yahweh does something, when there's a dot and a straight line and a dot, the two dots are equal. They're the same. That's the identifying characteristic. So the Aleph and the Tav being equal, which is why we have, you know, basically the white, which is the full white light contains the full spectrum of all the different colors, which is what the layout and such. The point is, what did Yahweh say? And what's he going to do? What's he going to hold us to? And if he says to our forefathers, I'm going to make you a deal. And this will be for the rest of time. And then I found other verses, which it says, it's the same terms I gave your forefathers. You get the same possible blessing. You also get the same possible curse. But the terms of the contract are identical. So we can't look it back at our forefathers in Israel and so, man, those guys, what a bum deal they got, you know? We just get to sit here with this new contract. They couldn't, no matter how hard they tried, and they still got beat up and terrorized and pillaged by their enemies, and gosh, that was a mean old God in that Old Testament to do that to them. Good thing we got a different guy, different terms, different circumstances now, and say, like, wait a second, that's not what that says. This says, first of all, all these words are possible, are easy, you can do them, you're expected to do them, you better do them. If you don't do them, you're in big trouble. And if you do them, you've got incredible rewards. Because the word Shavah, Shin Bet Ayin, which is the word seven, means to swear. 
an oath, and it's also a curse by obligation of oath. And if he says in Leviticus 26, if you guys, Israel, don't keep the words of this covenant as you've sworn to, four times he says, I will multiply the curse seven, and then the word is in the Hebrew, translated seven times or seven, it just says seven. I will multiply the curse Shabbat. Well, multiply the what? It doesn't say necessarily seven times, seven ways, seven what, but the point is this. Multiply the sworn oath. And so here's the clincher about the whole thing. If Yahweh sets up as terms of agreement, he says, okay, this is the way it's going to work. I'm going to make it real easy for you. And he designed this whole thing in his mind as the plan. He comes up with some words. Why did he choose words? We're studying words. We're learning words. Why? Why did he choose words? Contracts are determined by words. Every word, very particular. This is a contract. It's all about his words. He determined words. And then he said, if you pay attention to my words, with the measure of the attitude you have about my words, the exact same thing is going to happen to you regarding all your life concerns. Because, I'm paraphrasing, he says, all of my life concerns I'm incorporating and embedding into my words. My words are my house, as it were. And if you guys go, eh, whatever, to my words, you're going, eh, whatever, to my house, in which case, it's not like Yahweh even has to do it, but the automatic mechanism is that somebody's going to look at your house, your enemies are going to look at your house and go, eh, whatever. And it might mean weather circumstances, it might mean neighbors, it might mean burglars, it might mean your arch national enemy from the other side of the globe, it might mean you fill in the blank for your worst nightmare. In Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, all through, Yahweh says this. He says, I'm going to make this real clear. You guys bring the curse on your own head by the way you treat my words. That's in the terms of the contract. And if you don't like what you're getting, the purpose of this class is to say, we, we, we could stand here and yell and scream and raise our fist and bang on heaven's door, or we can just start doing what he said. As I, as I said in one other class, that the Romans used to tie a dead body on people and it would rot. And it's like, how do you get the dead body off? How do you get the dead body that we've inherited, which is the lies and distortions of false renderings of this Torah covenant? Just start doing what he said, and this thing falls off. It just disappears. Come and picture Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. Picture you. Oh, you could have gone home anytime. You could have gotten the monkey off your back anytime. You could have gone back to the covenant anytime. Just start doing it. So there's three basic questions, and we're facing it now that people in various congregations regarding the festival of Sukkot and the, the feast this year. One of them is, should we even bother? Now, a lot of people say, eh, yeah, no, whatever. Okay, end. That, that's the end of that line of questions. But if you say, I, I think we ought to bother. It's like, okay, the next question is, when? No one's ever told us how. Now, Thank you, Brother Yehuda. The Jews have kept keeping of the festivals. Are they accurate? I don't know. They have a thing called a held out calendar. Is it accurate? I don't know. But if they don't want to go along with it, bully for them. That's great. At least they're keeping it. Now, if I say, uh, I don't know if they're doing the right thing. Now, I've got to take the burden upon myself. Now, I can ask the Karaites. I can ask TorahCalendar.com and read that. I can... I can check with any other of my favorite knowledgeable teacher who I might trust, or I can take the burden on myself to sit here and learn these words and then read the scriptures and say, what did Yahweh say? For example, I read it, something the other day, and it said, there's three or four different, on the internet, there's four different uh, scriptural references saying, the new moon is cited in Jerusalem by two or more witnesses, the first letter of the new moon. And then it mentioned, it's called Rosh Kadesh, and it mentions four biblical sites, so I looked them up. 
It mentions the phrase Rosh Kadesh, but nowhere in those four sites does it say two witnesses in Jerusalem at the sliver. Well, where does that come from? Does it come from the Talmud? Does it come from the rabbis? Does it come from who knows? It might be right, but it doesn't come from the four scripture verses that they pointed to to verify their statement. This is a legal document. If he says there is something called Rosh Kadesh, and he quotes these four places, now I can look up and I can say, yep, there it is, those four places. But when he adds other stuff that was not part of the deal, that doesn't make it so. The point of being able to read these words is for us to go back and double check every detail of this contract. So when we see something here that says, hey, I get to have that, then I can say to Yahweh, hey, you, I can take you, Yahweh, to court in your own court, because he says heaven and earth are the witnesses. I can take you to court and say, hey, you said you do such and such, now why aren't you? And he says, did you read the rest of it? What it says is, if you guys ignore my words, I don't have to do anything. As a matter of fact, I've quoted a few times during the course of the class here, that there's verses where Yahweh says, Israel, if you plug your ears when I speak, I will plug my ears when you scream because your enemies are ripping you to shreds. Sounds like the Holocaust. Sounds like the Inquisition and any number of other things that might be going on. That's part of the legal stipulations. So if we or our friends or family or ancestors have found themselves getting ripped apart, we go, gosh, this is horrible. Why, why didn't we always step in? Let's go back to the terms of the contract. Did they fulfill the terms of the contract or not? How do we know? Well, I can't go back and rethink everybody's life, but I have the ability to rethink my life. As a matter of fact, Yom Kippur, it says you will afflict yourself. And we're told, okay, you have to not eat and not drink all day. Sorry, you won't find that in the scripture. What you'll find is the word anah, which is ayin, noon, hey. Now, if you read the Red Dictionary, you'll find a number of meanings of that word. One is to impoverish, to be meek, to be lowly, to be weakened. It also means to sing. It also means to fast. Does it say no water and no food? It doesn't say that. It says to fast. Well, fast how? That's the third question. Three questions about any of these matters. Is it valid today? Should we regard these things? Number two, when are we supposed to do it? What, where in the calendar? And the third question is, okay, if we figure that out, at least enough to give it a go, how? What are we supposed to do? Well, you see, I am looks means basically to look at, to regard, to consider, to weigh, to measure, to evaluate, to look deep into. Noon is life. Hey means to basically reveal or express. On the day of Yom Kippur, if you sit there and take the day to look at your life, you're doing that. Now, whether you fast or not, I can't prove to you, therefore I can't criticize anybody or condemn anybody, but I can suggest they look at their life on Yom Kippur which is the evening of the ninth day of the seventh month until the evening of the tenth day of the seventh month. And regardless of anything else, that is the commandment. Okay, so you go back here, and if you want to know what the ion matters are, you can start here at the top of this chart, read all the way down, and all these things are about ion stuff. You can look at noon and read all the way down, and that's noon stuff. Same for hay. But the thing about the contract is that what if you don't know quite how to read the letters? How do you know that it's a contract? Let me come back to here. Any contract starts with the first person. This is me. Who wrote it? Yahweh. Okay, this is Yahweh. This is, this is the me. Who's you? Israel or anybody else that wants to be in relationship to him. In the given position, this is me in relationship to you. So in other words, the terms of the contract, it says basically, fundamentally, I am determining to have a relationship with you. Where? How? 
What's it concerning? The letter Dalit. As we said before, I have to go pretty quick with this in the interest of time. Dalit is like four, fourth letter. It's the door. He came to the earth. The door earth is the door. And remember, we have the yield sign that means make a choice this way or that way. It's like a fork in the road. It's like a threshold. Earth is a place of choosing. Now, if he designed the entire universe, put this one ball, this sphere in the middle of the universe and says, this is the place where humans will come to make a choice. There's the door, there's the choosing of the Dalit, there's the map. Hey, revealing what? What's he revealing? What's the Bob? If, he's, if the hay is pointing, what's the Bob? There's this picture of a teeter-totter on a fulcrum where this is down and that's up, but it can shift the other direction. And if he's saying, listen, this whole contract is to explain the point about what life on the face of the earth is about. Hey, the Dalit, look at the Dalit, the choice. What's the choice? The choice is, what are you going to do? So everything in this life, all the consternation and the frustration and the perplexity, and it's like, gosh, what's going on? It's all designed for you to make hard choices, but you're going to make choices. And with the choices you make, Bob, there will be a reciprocal action. You know, in mathematics, a reciprocal is where you have one variable over another variable, and typically it's drawn as x and y. And the inverse is the reciprocal, where you have y over x. And if in this contract, as Yahweh is saying, here's this yoke, shape of the paleo letter Bob, it's kind of like a yoke, and here's the, here's the, kind of like the fulcrum. And he says, okay, whatever you do is going to come back. Whatever you do is going to come back. The way you treat your neighbor, if you do evil to your neighbor, you've now set yourself up according to the rules that the same measure that you have used to your neighbor is going to come back on you by your own action, on your own head. And it's similar to having... You know, there's this one time I was doing tearing off some concrete forms, and I had this stick, and I went to hit it, and with the same action that I drove my hammer into that stick, that stick broke and flew back and hit me right in the face and ripped my mouth open, and it's like, gosh! Now, who, who was the responsible party there? I was. I hit it with that force, the same force that flew back. Now, that was a pretty quick turnaround in the world of karma, you might say, type of thing, that goes around, comes around, sowing and reaping. It depends how big the wheel is, right? As we mentioned once before on the tape, like the letter Tet. If you have a small wheel and you run through some paint on the ground or a mud puddle, boy, it's pretty quick when it comes back around. But if you have a big giant wheel, you run over it, it might take a couple of years before it comes back, but when it comes back, and then things multiplied, right? Because you're always in the multiplication business. And so what he says is, you better be careful what you do. And then you say, oh, come on. Does he have more important stuff to do than tell us, oh, you better be careful what you do? Well, then you have this notion, El Al. It's the name of the Hebrew, Jewish, Israeli airline, El Al. But what does El Al mean? If you look at the word Aleph Lamed, it means, it's a short form of Elohim. It means God or deity or, but it also means motion toward, like something with a certain push of an energy in a certain direction. And then if you look at Ayan Lamed, you see, this word here, El Elyon, is technically translated as the Most High. Whereas El Shaddai is Almighty, this is Most High. So the reason this is in the Aleph position is because that's like, I am what I am, I will be what I will be. That's like the one who figured out the plan and do anything, it's an expression of the plan. But having then incorporated into reality, betness, physical substance, at the top of all that's made, now, when you have something at the top, it's in reference to other things. That's why most high is in the most high position. But you see, that's something made because it's a reference to substance, not esoteric to ether, like I am that I am, or I will be what I was. Do you understand? So each line has a certain thinking going to it. But in the following class, after Sukkot, we'll get into each one of these, just to tell you. But, but El Al, what's, what's simply I am Lamed? If you do Aliyah, it means going up to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is up on a hill, and it's the highest point in all the land of Israel. So even though we say, oh, that's like going back, and that's not back, but it's going up, and it's like, but that's Aliyah, it's up. I am Lamed, if you look in the dictionary, it literally means 
on, at, against, concerning, because of, on account of, and it also means yoke. A yoke, like the letter Vav, like also scale, you know, with a weight here and a weight there, and that balance on a fulcrum beam, which is the letter I am. Remember, that's where you get the picture of Libra, the scales, the constellation, and the, we talked about this back the letter I am, the ancient picture of the, of the Libra was a straight line and then this with a bump in it. Well, why is this Libra? Because Libra has to do with the scales of justice, and this is an altar with a sacrifice on it. That's where it comes from, an altar with a sacrifice on it. Because when you sacrifice, you now pay the debt where you're found wanting in the scales. So we can say El Al is the motion towards making everything yoked, balanced, making sure. In other words, by saying El Al, what you're really saying is Yahweh is the one who's going to see to it that his primary concern for all these many lives on the face of the earth, the billions of people that live here, his job is to see to it that every single thing we do comes right back on us. The great yoke in the sky. Because the eye is the eyeball, the watching one, the scales, and Lamed is the authority, the pushing and pulling, and he's going to see to it. He's going to make it his business to see to it that everything we do, we get coming back to us what we got coming. Now the point of this sacrifice on Yom Kippur, according to the covenant, was to pay the cost where we're found wanting if we are his people. So the question is, if this is the terms of the covenant with Israel, and we choose to be Israel, and we are his people, we can count on that sacrifice. But if somebody else came up with another term, and they wrote a contract, and we're counting on that sacrifice, is it the same one as that? And if they say, oh no, this is the new one, and it's not that one, they better rethink whether what they're trusting is as accurate as what we're trusting here. So if you go through this, you realize there's a cutting off in an offer, my offer, Yeshua, Yahweh say, door open. The hat is a picture of coming in. Well, if he says, hey, listen, part of the terms of this contract that is if you want to, you can come in. Then what? That's just where you begin to enter his kingdom. And that's back here at the hat. Tet, 100%, full. Hey, I'm completely his, completely in, completely safe. Yod is a hand of work, but it also speaks of working and activity. So if you think you can come in and kick back and sit there and say, oh boy, I'm sure glad I'm in here. There's nothing more for me to do. That's kind of contradictory to the meaning of the yo. And then if you look at the letter cough and it says, here's some terms, terms, regulation, stipulation. These are the protocols of the kingdom. Yahweh is obligated by those terms of the cough to give you everything, but it's conditional if we do what he says according to those same terms of the cough. And then with the letter Lamed, by the authority and the regard that we give those words, he gives us the authority and the regard. You see, if the Lamed is a shepherd, quite a few places, Yahweh says, I will be your Elohim and you will be my people. If he gives us his hand to eat from, we being his people will eat from his hand and that will also be our covering because the cough is this and it's also that. That's why Kippur, the covering, the kippah is the hat, the covering. If we want to eat from his hand, he'll cover us. Kind of like a picture of those two hands that we showed a few weeks ago. If we eat from his hand, he will cover us. If we won't eat from his hand, he is legally entitled to not cover us. So if we have a different contract that says, oh, we don't have to eat these things from your hand. Does he have another hand offering other people other terms? Maybe the paper boy, but is it the same as his spouse? The authority of the shepherd, he says, I will be your Elohim and you will be my people. If we choose to be his people according to his terms, he now has a contractual obligation to be the shepherd. If he says in the position of the Mem and Nun, you need to nurture with warm affection my words. 
to get the blessing. The reciprocal promise is he will nurture us with warm affection. It's exactly the same. So if we sit there and say, yeah, but we have a contract. Somebody told me about a contract that says, I don't need warm affection regarding his Torah. I can despise it. I can spit it out. I can ignore it and reject it. Maybe they were lied to. And if they were truly lied to, then what's happening by them despising it, spitting it out, having a distaste for it, not having more affection for it, is that unbeknownst to them, they have set themselves up for the terms of relationship with Yahweh himself to be treated the exact same way, spit out, despised, and no warm affection. And they could say, yeah, but I believe differently. It doesn't matter what you believe. It's the terms of the covenant. The terms of the contractual agreement. The reason for us to come back to the terms of this covenant is so that we can finally figure out what we're supposed to be doing so that we can do it, so that we, all, we can have all the benefits. And the whole notion of the sevenfold curse the reciprocal is a sevenfold blessing. And I've found verses where Yahweh said, all these blessings that I promised your forefathers have been held in abeyance in my warehouses to pour out upon the generation of those who will choose, doubt it, to enter the cat, the fence, learn my words, cough lamed, have a warm affection towards them, mem noon, so that they will sprout Good fruit, stomach, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And when I look at them, I am. Yahweh says he will rejoice. We talked about last week. Yahweh will rejoice to see his people regarding his words at his mouth, the pay. And then the picture of the Zadi is the sprouting back into life, like Aaron's rod that budded, sprouting the dead stick living. Kuf Reshim Tav, Kuf is after this. That's a picture of the later on when Resh, our exalted in Eliyahu, comes back. We see him face to face. Sheen, he gives the rewards that he promised, the ornamentation, the Adar, that, that letter we talked about last week, Aleph, Dalit, Resh. But some will end up being thrown into the fire. And Tav, he says, just like I said, just like I proposed in Helen, everything's accomplished that you'll see it to be so. So if we look at these things, this is the Mishkan pattern. If you line up these letters, this is Daniel 12. If you read these words and you get a concept of what these letters mean, I'll go through Daniel 12 real quick. We've only got a couple minutes left here. The Aleph concept of the plan. Daniel hides the words of the book until the time of the end. In the bet position, there's something locked up there, and it says, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Running to and fro, what? Looking for what's been locked up. Gimel. Gimel goes back and forth. Daniel said, I looked, I saw one on this side of the river, and one on that side of the river. That's like this back and forth, this inference. And they looked at one above the waters of the river, clothed in white linen. That's in the Dalit position. The one above the white. Now we say, well, we'll look at the book of Revelation. The only one who's worthy of being clothed in white linen is the Mashiach, the Messiah, is Yeshua. And he's the one above all the waters, and all the waters are generally regarded prophetically as people. He looks at the one above the waters of the river. Now, if that's the Mashiach, he says, hey, calling for revelation, how long did the end of these wonders? And this one, the Dalit position, now in the Bob position, because he has the fifth letter, now that's in the fifth, fifth position, now the sixth position, which is Bob. He held up his right hand and his left hand. That's the paleo letter Vav. And Vav is a man. So here's the man in the Vav position. It's the same as the Dalit position. And it says he swore by him who lives forever. When you look at the book of Revelation where John saw the vision. And, the, and, and Yeshua saying, I'm the Aleph and the Tav. He says, I is the one who is dead and yet I live and I live forever. Well, that's the same phrase. The Vav man Zion. This Yeshua, the Mashiach. The Dalit man who came and he even said, I am the Dalit, I'm the door, who's now also compared with the Vav, who was Zion. So Zion is the letter which was cut off, put to death, outside the Chet, the next letter. And it says he'll be for 
time, times, and half the time. What I'm saying is that, because we're at the end here of what we can do, if you look at each one of these lines and you realize that each one of them, like cogs on a wheel, click, 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 each phrase lines up with each letter of the alphabet. And if you study these things and you look at these things and you realize, I've got Exodus 20, Jeremiah 31, and Daniel 12. Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments. Jeremiah 31 is the so-called New Covenant. And if you look at the things that are in those positions and try to think, why does each one of those fit with these letters? What you realize is that the terms of the covenant are quite simply, I'm the creator. You can be my bride, my woman, my wife, my people. Choose to come into my kingdom. That's the hep, that's the Mishnah people. Learn my instructions. That's the kafamama, the elder sacrifice. Nurture them within you. That's the labor. Do what I said in application of justice and righteousness. That's the menorah of the summit. What you do will be weighed and measured, determined and measured back to you. That's the I am. Pay the mouth. And I will talk to you about it and show you the way it works. And the people that don't want to regard my words will never hear my words, and so they're left with dark eyes of blindness. So there's one thing I want to say. We're right at the end here. I kind of wrote this down. I didn't get a chance to uh, quite go through this. Yeshua dying on the cross is the penalty for our infraction being paid, not our responsibility absolved. If you get in a car accident and you smash up another vehicle and you get hospital bills and he comes and you have attorney fees and all this other stuff, he says, tell you what, pay the hospital bills, I'll pay the attorney fees, I'll pay for the vehicle, I'll pay for everything. Now get behind the wheel and drive straight. Doesn't mean you should smash things up again. The responsibility is not absolved. For him to die on the cross and for us to be called back home doesn't mean we disregard what he's saying. Read the contract in Hebrew. So I want to say this into the camera. Hey, brother Ishmael, who told you to sacrifice your children with explosives trying to kill Yitzhak's sons? Oh, Esau, who has deceived you to cut your own throat by fierce hatred against your twin brother, Yaakov. You people of the book, you lost 12 tribes with amnesia. What voice in your ear has tempted you to cut off one hand with your own other hand? Which enemy has incited the sons of Abraham against each other? Knowing that itself, that enemy, has no authority itself to do something against those people according to the terms of this brick. Providing that Abraham and his descendants shall be invincible if they would only learn, watch, keep, and guard these instructions of this Torah. To not keep it is to invite Babel, the confused head of gold in Daniel chapter 2 of the kingdoms of the world driven by madness and the lust for wealth and rage against the prescribed order of Yahweh. Who has tricked the sons of light to have blind eyes and war against one another, giving their inheritance to the instigator behind the scenes? Who is the unseen hand provoking the sons of Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, and Jacob to murder each other at the compelling of these other forces who have nothing to do with the covenant of Yahweh given to this family. Amen. Who is turning these people against each other? You don't have to do it. Is it the devil? Is it Yahweh? Is it our own curse that we have chosen against ourselves because we have, each one of us, rejected Yahweh's words of instruction? If we want to stop this madness that we are being compelled to do by other forces who are trying to pillage the people of Abraham's descendancy of faith in Yahweh, 
Stop doing the injustice and the slaughter of each other and start doing what Yahweh said. The Sabbath day, the festivals in Leviticus 23, justice and mercy, righteousness as we love one another. That's doing Yahweh's Torah and living into Yeshua's commandment to follow Him. Hallelujah.